Well, uh, this is uh, the title of my real title is uh, what Cooper said. You know that that was a, 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 an amazing talk, and it was a guy that's actually doing it, and that's so inspirational for me. It was just a, a phenomenal story. So uh, I'm a holistic veterinarian, as you'll find out what that means. Uh, and I just wanted to, uh, can, can, you, can you see the big print anyway? Take two grass-fed steaks and call me in the morning. That was an article out of the Wall Street Journal. And I thought, uh, you know, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, and uh, again, my, my day job, I work for Thousand Hills Cattle Company. We're 100% grass-fed gourmet beef. Uh, we kill about, well, a minimum 250 head a week. So we're small, maybe 350 head a week at the, at the most. But uh, that was my recipe for grass-fed beef hot dogs. It, you know, you think of hot dogs as a junk food. Uh, and I, I just thought some of these newspaper articles are interesting. Uh, that was Mark Twain. If you, if you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you read the newspaper, you're misinformed. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about this fake meat stuff because uh, I find it rather humorous and uh, also a little bit disturbing. Uh, you know, the expectations versus the reality. You know, t speaking of technology, isn't it funny they have all these power lights right on the screen? Uh, that just seems a little odd to me, but oh well, what do I know? Uh, the Beyond the burger and the beef burger, I guess I have to look this way. Uh, you know, it's like all these fake ingredients uh, in the fake meat, and they're kind of pr promoting it as a health food. Uh, and it's not really healthy. Uh, this is uh, the ingredients on the right of what we make, the whole ingredient list. <laughs> and then you can see this other ingredient list. How to confuse a vegan, yeah. Uh, I live in Minneapolis. I have a food store there of farm-to-table food. But uh, uh, we don't get too many vegans in. Uh, this is my message to them, though. This lettuce died just so you could be a vegetarian. So have a heart, eat rocks. I'm not, as you can see, I'm not very politically correct. Even though I'm from a politically correct state, you'll learn pretty quickly that I'm not what they call woke. I was thinking, oh, I got here. I'm going to wear my hat because these lights. And I, then I was thinking, yeah, you know, this is a $300 hat on a 10 cent head. And uh, which, you know, speaking to George W. Bush, you know, yeah. Oh, he said something political. Oh. Uh, this was something I was talking to the people in the hotel this morning. It's like, thanks, Jesus, for this food. And then Jesus says, uh, de nada. You know, he's the guy that raised your food. Um, can cattle be good for the climate? That's another one that we get all the time uh, at, at Thousand Hills. We do a lot of beef demonstrations. And, you know, my, my short answer is there was between 70 and 100 million bison here before we got here. And it didn't seem like they wrecked the environment, you know. So the, the, we had, there was more ruminants right where we're standing than there, than there are in this country now. And they didn't wreck it. So uh, I'll go on from that, I hope. Uh, this is uh, Nicolette Nyman. She wrote Defending Beef. This is a fabulous book. Because if you're a beef producer, sooner or later you're going to get the angry vegan, you know, that's telling you that you're screwing up the planet. And her book just, just kind of nails it. They're, the Nymans are beef producers in California. I am the certifier inspector for the American Grass-Fed Association. So all 60 of our producers for Thousand Hills are inspected and certified as, number one, American. You know, there's a lot of imported grass-fed beef. Uh, and when we have the sticker, the AGA sticker on our beef in the grocery store, uh, we don't sell our beef to the guy that's going to eat it. We sell it to B2B, business to business. We sell it to grocery store chains like Natural Grocers. Uh, every, I think every food co-op in America uh, has our beef. But we want that AGA sticker to differentiate ourselves from cheater beef that isn't, uh, is, isn't American or isn't 100% uh, uh, grass-fed. Uh, we also are certified by the Savory Institute. We're a savory hub for this institute that's created 
something with a bad name, maybe it's a good name in South Africa, but it's Ecological Verification Outcome, EOV. And we certify every one of our ranches as being that. And the purpose of that is we've gone from the word sustainable, which is still a great word, to regenerative. So if you're sustainable, that's one thing, but if you're regenerative, you're doing what Cooper has done, is build it better. Uh, you know, so this is our red hat we, we care, where is the, uh, the other mega hat, Make America Graze Again. Uh, this is a book by my old buddy, Jerry Bernetti. Jerry Bernetti, many of you are too young to have known what, what a, a force of nature he was on the, on the whole movement. But Acres USA, which is, by the way, the largest eco-agriculture bookstore in the world, uh, has this book. And it's, it's kind of got it all. The farm is ecosystem. Uh, and this kind of sums up by this guy from University of Missouri, Clifford Willis. You can put a Band-Aid on a livestock problem, but you will not fix a problem until you fix the soil. Gee, they didn't teach us that in vet school, believe me. We learned nothing about soil and nothing about plants, which is rather ironic. Yeah, okay, so this is kind of changing the paradigm, and this is kind of what Cooper talked about, and it's unfair to have a, a dairy animal next to a beef animal, but, but we're looking for that block of meat in our genetics. That's what we're, we're trying to achieve. Um, I thought this was interesting, speaking of food and junk food. I got this out of the newspaper I was reading on the airplane yesterday. Um, and it's funny, I always seem to, I like to read a newspaper before I get up on the stage. I'm kind of like you, Cooper. It's, I'd rather be out in the grass than up here. But, you know, this came into my lap yesterday. Uh, Gen Z is driving the LGBTQ uh, identity. So I'm a member, uh, I'm a baby boomer up here, uh, and the U.S. average of people that identify as, they don't know whether they're a boy or a girl, uh, is about 7%. Uh, in my generation, there was usually one person in our class, maybe, if that, that was gender confused. Then you go down to uh, my children, which are Gen Xers, uh, it jumped up to 3.3. Then millennials, so I work with a lot of millennials, it's jumped up to 11% of people that identify LGBTQ. Uh, and then Gen C, uh, Z, uh, from 1997 to 2012, 19.7% are gender confused. And uh, I'm, I'm not talking about right or wrong or anything, I'm just talking about why, why is this? And part of it is the acceptance of uh, gender confused people, which is, is wonderful. I think that's great, but we look at, um, uh, hormone confusing products uh, in our food that that are that alter uh, our hormones and our food I believe is uh, a big part of this I just a little bit I just wanted to sum up what would be bad things for cowboys cowgirls but all of these things are things that are basically to be avoided as much as possible um, I, uh, I was looking at this room, which is such a wonderful, I'm looking at the Missouri River Valley, uh, beautiful room, but I turned on my EMF uh, measuring devices, and this room is like a microwave oven that we're setting in. With all the Wi-Fi, all the electronics, we're getting zapped in this room. Uh, so it's like this combination, we've got a tub full of Mountain Dew over there, which, you know, the highest... Uh, sugar and the highest caffeine of all the soda pops, but there's brominated um, phosphoric acid, which what they think is makes do so addictive. And I'm in the sticks most of my work. I'm out in the uh, boondocks, and I see a lot of kids that are do heads. They're addicted, and it's uh, considered to be a gateway drug to meth. Uh, so it's just like, but all all sodas, all of these things are things that are not good. Uh, these things I consider, I've compiled a list of things in my lifetime of things that we should hang out with, that we should eat. Uh, all of these things are things that uh, uh, will build your lifespan and make you a healthier person. You notice, uh, like Ann said, there's a lot of good saturated natural fats in that list. Uh, a lot of that comes, there's a million books on health. This just is one that I've been reading a lot. You can't just go buy it, although you can buy used ones off of Amazon. Uh, it's called Cured. It's, it's, it's jam-packed with 
all types of natural alternative treatments for diabetes, cancer. My family is ravaged with cancer, uh, diabetes, arthritis, Alzheimer's. There's hardly anybody left in my family. All my aunts and uncles are dead. Uh, but this book is, uh, it'll blow your mind. And speaking of Kansas, this is the town, my hometown, uh, Nashville, Kansas, a tiny little town uh, in southwestern Kansas. This is a, a picture of where my mother was born. Uh, the house is gone. Uh, she's, this is my mother. She lived to be 101 uh, and unfortunately kind of died of medical mistakes, you know, at that advanced age. She was fine. The, the treatment care that she got was not. And those are some of my cousins that she's telling us about how she milked cows. Uh, one thing I take as a compliment, you know, I, I always get called a snake oil peddler, being a holistic vet. I thought, well, my grandpa actually sold snake oil. And that's my grandfather, my mother's father. And he got his neck broke by a horse reared up on him and uh, under a, going into the barn. And he had to go on the road like this in this cart. And he was selling literal snake oil. And my family, uh, his family came from Kentucky were a lot of coal miners, and the women would wrap a snake, dead snake, in a fruit jar, put it on the stove, and they'd render snake oil out of it. And those miners believed that it helped them not get arthritis. And uh, so he, he sold that. That's, that's, my, that's the same guy. And this is what he did. He, uh, he raised uh, blackjack mules for the TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority. And in the Depression, while everybody was suffering, the Dust Bowl in Kansas, he sold 100 giant mules to the TVA for $100 a piece. And my mother, when she was a little girl, during the Depression, they'd go around the countryside and they could buy a good work mare for 25 cents. And they would bring them home, they'd breed them to these big jacks, and they'd make these big mules. So that, they, they lived pretty high on the hog in that era. This is Nashville back in their day, uh, when I was there uh, maybe a year or so ago, I go back to Kansas periodically. That's the same town from the same view uh, from that. This has jumped ahead a little bit. I, 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 I took my horse slides out of here. I'm not going to talk about horses uh, in this talk. Uh, this, I do have this picture. I just wonder if anybody knows what kind of horse this is. You shout it out. I don't hear it. Uh, it's a quarter horse. Yep. His, his name is Silver. Just thought I have a little bit in there. So, Daryl, I guess this is for you. Uh, you kind of claimed that last one, but uh, you know, I know you're an athlete. But there's four things you don't even need to take your shoes off to count this list. Uh, water runs downhill. There's no free lunch. Everything is related to everything, and nature bats last. So these are the rules that we're governed by. Uh, yeah, I just put this on here, the global human population. You talk about how are we going to feed the world? And uh, Channel 12 was here earlier when Ann was talking. I talked to a reporter from the, the Bismarck TV station. And uh, it was just interesting. I, I just had to say, you know, this feed the world stuff with GMO uh, corn and beans isn't going to do it. And I, 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 was, I guess I was kind of up on my hind legs, but I was talking about here we are at a beautiful university, but none of this stuff that we're going to be talking about, what Cooper did and uh, what we do, uh, is taught in the land-grant colleges. And land-grant colleges were started in Abraham Lincoln's time to teach agriculture. But I'm a, a three-degree uh, person from Kansas State University, and I didn't learn... I only learned how to read science and things like that, but I rarely use anything I learned in my land-grant college times. Um, I was telling some people on the way here, I was at South Dakota State, uh, SDSU, and I gave a talk at the dairy department, and I got there early, I drove, and the dean of the d dairy department took me up to his office and said, oh, you want some coffee? And I said, yeah. And uh, I, I'm kind of a wimp, I drink cream in my coffee. In fact, I love a little coffee in my cream. Uh, but anyway, they had a gallon jug of coffee mate there, or whatever that stuff's called, that fake uh, soybean juice, in the dairy department. I just thought, oh my God, they're not walking the walk here. <laughs> Again, a little grim statistics, uh, feeding the world. 
Uh, this is the number of operations from 92 to 12. Uh, you know, we've, we've really lost a lot of operations, uh, which I find to be some of those kind of needed to go anyway. There's a lot of bad things uh, in uh, big production. The, uh, the l l l manure, lagoon manures, uh, they've turned God's gift to agriculture, which is manure, into a toxic waste substance. Uh, and this is a picture from the, the, the uh, tall grass prairie in Kansas, the Flint Hills. And anytime you see erosion like this, what's the number one cause? What? You can say it's overgrazing, right? And then the other thing is, uh, is compaction. Uh, I was on Gabe and Paul Brown's farm, God bless them, uh, and I, uh, we did a water infiltration test where we simulated an inch of rainfall, and we, just pour, we put a ring of metal in the ground. We knew exactly how much to pour in, had the timer. He could uh, uh, infiltrate an inch of rain in nine seconds. He could infiltrate a foot of rain in just a few minutes, a foot of rain, how, I mean, you know, granted in Bismarck, it, you know, in your 10 inches of rain, it'll come in these toad stranglers, you know, three or four inches at a time. So that all usually runs off into that river right there or into the Gulf of Mexico, not on Gabe's Brown. Every drop of rain that falls on the Brown Ranch uh, stays on the Brown Ranch and that's infiltration. This is not infiltration and when you see erosion like that, uh, that means that they have compacted soil. Oh, breaking my heart here. This is just uh, compacted soil. This is a so-called grass-fed dairy in Pennsylvania. Uh, and this is what I see. Uh, I'm on the road about 100 nights a year uh, traveling across rural America. And this is what I see as, uh, like my own hometown, drying up. So I'm going to cut to the chase, and I'm going to go a little bit fast here, if, as fast as this thing will let me go. This is like having a governor on your gas pedal. I call this the three biggest lies in livestock production. And uh, the first lie uh, is that germs are the cause of disease, and they are not. And uh, I won't go into a, a lot of depth here, but I will just say uh, this is old medicine. Uh, Anne brought up Louis Pasteur. He uh, came up with the germ theory that everybody bought. Uh, he was working with the other French physiologist, uh, Duchamp, and Duchamp believed in the terrain theory that it's about we're the terrain, or our cattle are the terrain, or our chickens, whatever, uh, that, that is faulty. So we've, we've gotten beyond the germ theory. And um, the second lie, and this is again what we were all taught, is everything is genetic. Our health, our longevity, our intelligence is genetically predetermined, which is finding out is not true at all. And um, there, there's a friend of uh, mine who was scheduled to have a bilateral mastectomy uh, taking off both breasts, at pre, pre, pre -act, um, presumptively, uh, no, that's not the word I want, but anyway, preactively, something like that. Uh, so she did, because her mother died of breast cancer. And the doctor forgot to ask her one thing in this case, she was adopted. And, uh, but anyway, they were gonna cut off her breasts because her mother died of breast cancer. And we find out it's less than 5% of cancer is genetic. And this is, uh, this is where health comes from, combination of uh, uh, environment, heredity, lifestyle, uh, medical treatment. And, and then there's epigenetics now, and epigenetics are this. Here's a little fetus in the mother's womb. She's probably got a martini in the other hand, a cigarette in the other. And this little child is maybe, it's not the genetics of this child, but it's the epigenetics that we're talking about. And this is a big word now. And then the third lie in uh, medicine, and believe me, I, this, I made this slide way before COVID came out, uh, the big jab. Uh, but I'm just saying you cannot vaccinate your way to health. And the best any vaccine does is block just one way to get sick. And not even a very good job of that. Most vaccines technically are only about 50, 70, 30% effective. Uh, they'll protect that many animals or people from getting that one condition. So uh, I, I uh, decided to go uh, 
complete gonzo in 1999. I started my holistic veterinary practice in 1980, and I hardly used any vaccine, I hardly used any antibiotics, hardly used any chemical warmers. But I decided in 1999, I'm going to walk the, the walk, and I'm going to go off of it. And I, I had a little bit of an uh, anxiety problem when I did that, because I didn't have what you should do instead, which I do now. And this is the government's answer to everything. This is a burning pile of flesh from uh, this particular one. It was from England with a brucellosis outbreak. It could have been BSE. They, they do the same thing. The government... Uh, that's their answer to everything, is to just kill them. And this is the paradigm that Ann was talking about. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. I mean, it's a little bit of an overstatement, but it's basically the truth. And, you know, that was the result. This is a book about how the minerals change our our DNA, change our, our genetic code. This is Dr. Uh, Ulrey. Uh, he, uh, Richard Ulrey, uh, co-wrote this book with the founder of Acres USA, Charles Walters. Uh, it's a complicated book, but he just proved that we can, we can easily change the structure of our DNA. Uh, and there's three sacraments, basically, to modern medicine. Uh, vaccine, as I mentioned earlier, is... Uh, the first one, these are the ones that are considered sacred in my profession. Hmm. And I, again, I put this slide together before COVID, but it's my version or someone's version of how they make vaccine. You've got your nerve disease, your cancer virus, squalene, live polio virus, and mercury, uh, stirring it up by a skeletal ghost. Uh, and then the seven-way or five-way vaccines are one of the cardinal violations in vaccine because let's say you get a seven-way for all the clostridials, uh, tetanus, black leg, lumpy jaw, wooden tongue. How, how, many, how many of you have ever gotten seven diseases at the same time? Because that's what the body thinks happen when you get a seven-way vaccine. So the multivalent vaccines are uh, a compounded evil. And that was just a, a listing of all the bovine vaccines that are recommended. The second sacrament is wormers, uh, and it could be Ivomac, could be Cydexin. No matter which one of those you use, you're killing your soil livestock, your soil biology, all the way up to the king of the soil livestock, which is the dung beetle. And if you don't have dung beetles, you're going to have more fly problems because all the nasty flies, like face flies, horn flies, they breed in manure, and the dung beetles take that manure apart and dry it out. Uh, and uh, so if you're killing them with chemical warmers, you're really shooting yourself in the foot. And, and you know, doing warming and vaccine is, is high stress uh, for people. Uh, they're doing porons, they're doing walkthroughs. Um, I think I'll just hold my finger on this, this plunger. Spraying, fogging the pig facilities or the chicken facilities, fogging it. Uh, the poor guy that works in there. When I was a kid, they had DDT trucks running through the neighborhoods for polio. Uh, the polio was rampant when I was a kid. And the trucks were kind of fun. They were like something, a novelty. And they were putting out this big fog in the back. And us kids would run along in that fog. We thought it was really cool. I thought it was a good idea to teach these kids something that they're not getting in school. And it turned out to be kind of a, it kind of backfired on me uh, because a, a kid in college is, is a, a victim of the teachers. They own you. They rule you. And if you tell the teacher that you know something they don't know, you're going to get killed. And these kids were getting killed. And it was just really uh, bad juju. And I just thought, I just got to let them wait till they get out and get re empowered again. Uh, again, was, this is uh, what we do. We actually have herbal fly repellents that we can put in these oilers. But here's what happens with uh, pesticides. The amphibians are the most uh, sensitive of all the animals to sides and, uh, because their skin is just uh, translucent and uh, transparent. 
And then the other one is the pollinators. We've got something called colony collapse disorder. And as we go a little further, I'll tell you uh, the main theory about colony collapse disorder. But uh, like I said, this room right now is buzzing with EMF, with radio frequency. Uh, and that is out in rural America now. Uh, where they're putting 5G down our throat, and their the goal is to get uh, a cell phone tower every five miles. Uh, and that 5G is very toxic, and it's billions of times more powerful than the natural EMF that's in the planet. We have the North Pole, we have the South Pole, we have ley lines, so there's an Earth energy that's actually very good. That is what the birds use to fly to South America. That's what the bison and the elk use to migrate. That's what uh, uh, butterflies, you know, butterfly has a brain the size of a pinhead, and they can fly to South America. Uh, you know, and the way they do it is to tune into this. Well, the man-made frequencies are billions of times stronger. And I'll, sh I'll bring my meter over here um, just to show you guys how hot it is just in this room. But I'm on about 100 farms a year, and I take a bag of meters with me to check them for stray voltage and check them for uh, EMF. And I'll show you some pictures of that. But uh, usually anything, under, uh, anything over 100 nanowatts is carcinogenic. And I've been on farms where it's, it's, it's almost always 15,000 to 30,000 of these nanovolts right on the farm. And the, I work with a lot of Amish and Mennonite and Hutterite. You know, they don't even have electricity and they open their front door and there's a cell phone tower right across the road. They're getting fried and they, they don't like it. They, they're starting to learn that. Oh, this is working better. Uh, this is uh, down in Texas. Uh, we used to have these large dung beetles in Kansas. So we played with them. We call them, I can't remember what we call them. But anyway, uh, they, they uh, can take a big manure pat, and within a couple hours, it's gone. It's absolutely gone. And they're, so they're like, uh, if you have dung beetles, you're gold. This is the third element uh, of antibiotics, and uh, that's not an uh, unrealistic photograph there. 80% of all antibiotics are used in factory farm animals in spite of the government telling us that they're going to stop that. Uh, so when you're eating that meat or eggs or milk, you're getting those antibiotics. Uh, a healthy digestive tract, this is what Ann was talking about, the microbiome. 80% good guys, 20% uh, res temporary residents, uh, whereas in an unhealthy digestive tract, uh, the bad guys outnumber the good guys, so it's, it's an unfair fight. Oh, boy, this is great. So this is Ryan Hermanson. He's one of our producers. He was the first producer at Thousand Hills. I met him when he was 22 years old, and he's right out of college, and he wanted to uh, get started doing this, and he's a, a success now. Uh, this is a Joel Salad book, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. Uh, I love this book, and I love Joel Salad and the stuff that he's done. Uh, to advance that war stories from the local food front. And there's a U.S. duh tank rolling up the road. Uh, this is Percy Smizer. He's a guy who raises organic canola. He's worked his whole lifetime to develop his strain of canola. And one day he saw some trench coat guys out there with a government vehicle, or it looked like a government vehicle, and they were chopping some of his canola and taking it. He got arrested for owning some of Monsanto's, I mean Monsanto's um, uh, genetic material is GMO canola. And he eventually won, but it was tough. This is the polyculture prairie. I, I put a couple of my pictures in there. This was a farm in uh, North Carolina that was uh, uh, woods. When the furniture industry tanked around Asheville, North Carolina, uh, there used to be the hillbillies would take care of the, the trees, all hard, hardwood forest. So when they could not it was a vertical industry. They made the furniture around towns like Asheville, and that's where all the good furniture came from in America. Now the Asian imports have tanked it, so uh, now these woods have overgrown. So this friend of mine bought thousands of acres of this vertical land. It's very, it's in the Appalachians, but it was all junk trees, and he couldn't, uh, he couldn't utilize it. But where we're looking there, this grass is redeemed uh, former junk forest. This is probably, maybe in my opinion, one of the most important pictures I'll ever put up here. Uh, how, how many people know what BRICS is? To raise your hand. Okay. How many people never raise their hand when somebody asks? Yeah, okay, just curious, you know. Uh, but BRICS is the equivalent of nutrient density, the nutrient density. And 
my parents' generation, like my mother-in-law, just they don't understand nutrient density. She thinks a banana is just a banana. You know, it's like that's good for you. She doesn't realize that they're not always good. But we, what we do is we take the sap from if, any living plant, and sap is like the blood of a plant. Like if I pulled some blood out of your arm and held it up to the light and looked at it, it was like Kool-Aid, that would not be good, right? That's what plant sap is. And when you put a drop of plant, and you can see it in my little demo section over there where Ann's setting, uh, you can see what a BRICS refractometer looks like. But personally, I believe every farmer should have one of these because this is your grade card. If you go out there and your BRICS on your grass hits 12, you are gold. You can finish cattle on grass. However, if I drove from this podium to my house in the summer and checked every mile or two, what do you think I'm going to find? Three, three or four. That's, what, that's what's happened to our grassland. And three, gra three bricks grass is like a nothing burger. Uh, they, they just, they could eat their head off and they'd be 20 years old and they still would never finish. Uh, that, that, uh, and we've, we've got uh, a guy, Ralph Voss down in Missouri, he's got 20 bricks fescue. And 20 bricks fescue does not get into fight. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't get the parasite, parasitic fungus and because uh, it, it's a healthy plant. If you have low bricks fescue, you're going to have endophyte problems. Uh, this is just another story about minerals. This is about Ira Allison, and he was considered the miracle of the Ozarks. He was a quack doctor. He had some kind of mail order degree, but he was treating for people, treating people for the diseases of around 1900, which most people died of consumption, which is TB, brucellosis or TB. He had about a hundred percent cure rate. If you could crawl in there, he could fix you. And the only thing he used was a, a mineral cocktail. And um, then he didn't get the Nobel Peace Prize for that. He got arrested. And, and put in prison. Uh, so he never practiced again. They knocked him out of business. And all he was using was a mineral cocktail, which I hope I can show you in just a minute. It had zinc. I'll go back to zinc. It had zinc in it. It had cobalt in it. Cobalt makes B12, cyanocobalamin. And it had, um, and this is what should be in your mineral mix, and it had copper in it. And copper uh, is so critical for health. It's, copper is your, basically your anti-parasite mineral. Um, and it had manganese in it. This was all they used. Uh, they, they put, and there was iodine in it. I wanted to show you a mineral cocktail. See, there's a lot of stuff that was known and then it was forgotten. When the white magic penicillin came out, uh, people that raised livestock or doctors forgot a thousand years of folk wisdom because they had the magic white stuff. And even when I was a baby vet, we could walk out onto a farm with a syringe of combiotic or penstrap or uh, LA, LA 300 wasn't around then, but we'd use that. and. Almost everything got better when we'd give it. Uh, and a lot of this was missing. So Randallay Farms, which became Carnation Dairy, this was their mineral recipe that they made. And they were such an amazing uh, ranch and so scientific that they actually raised lab rats on different mineral concoctions. They would kill the rats, slice the bones, and look at it under the microscope to see how well mineralized they were. This is Dr. A uh, Allison's formula the mango, the copper, the cobalt, zinc, and potassium iodide, and he was getting 100% cure of animals. This is the government's answer to everything. They've got TB and brucellosis in their herds out there, and what their solution is, well, let's just kill all the Yellowstone bison because that's what we do. Uh, they're not mineralized. They're not able to migrate. Bison used to migrate thousands of miles to all the mineral licks and the salt licks, so they actually got it. It's not in the soil anymore, it never was. There never was soil that's completely mineralized. And I have so many people, uh, they, they forget, you showed a slide from uh, Fred Provenza, and I don't know where she moved, 
Oh, there you are. But Fred Provenza, he's written a book called Nourishment. It's a fabulous book. He's a, a nutritionist, livestock nutritionist at Utah State University. And uh, he's written uh, several books about uh, their, their, the needs of animals to get minerals. Uh, but he, we could cure these Yellowstone bison by just throwing some nice mineral out for them, and the TB would go away, the brucellosis would go away. And in this book, Grass, the Forgiveness of Nature by Charles Walters, uh, which is a fabulous book, uh, he has an interview from some farmers in the 30s, and they said, well, what did you guys do for hog cholera? He said, oh, we just fed it out of them. Well, what'd you do for brucellosis, which is undulant fever? Oh, we fed it out of our herd. And I just thought that's such a beautiful phrase that they could do that kind of healing just with minerals. I started in some other uh, cowboy tool kits. I believe every farm should have a homeopathic first aid kit. And if you get an 18 remedy or you get a 30 remedy kit, you can get them online. Uh, you can treat, you can doctor 99 of the most common things for your family or for your herd with, with homeopathy. Uh, I don't talk about it a lot because it's energy medicine and uh, you can't see it. You can't, it's, you know, it's, it's not a molecular, it's an energy medicine, as is rescue remedy. At Thousand Hills, all of our truck drivers are trained at Bud Williams Livestock Handling School. So when we load cattle, which we do every day, uh, the first thing that these guys do, they take a, a, a bottle, uh, like a laundry spray bottle, fill it up with the best water they can find, uh, the purest, they put two drops of rescue remedy in there, and then they hit it on their hand a hundred times hard to, to agitate it, to activate the, the, the five essences that are in it. And they can walk through the trailer with a spray bottle, spray the trailer or uh, the truck, uh, and maybe walk down the line where they're loaded up to get in the truck, and they just march right into the truck. There's no, no fighting. Uh, everybody's quiet. It's, it's absolutely amazing to see these cowboys using uh, something that they don't even know how it works, but they, they, they love it. Again, I, 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 this, this is a picture. Gabe Brown and I were in uh, giving a talk out east, and we had a half a day off. And Gabe is a collector of old uh, books, old livestock books and old ag books. So we walk in this big bookstore, and it was in Philadelphia. And we said to this guy, you got any old books on agriculture? And this guy, do I? So he, he goes up to the attic, and he starts bringing down boxes of these things. And I think Gabe brought... Uh, he could correct me if I'm wrong, it was like $14,000 worth of stuff right in that bookstore. Uh, and this was one of the newspapers I found. And this is written in uh, 1843, as you can see up there, but it was given in a speech in 1818. And this, this guy says, great profits in agriculture can only result from great improvements of the soil. So, see, see, we knew that. Uh, and it's the liberal hand that maketh rich. Now, this is not new agey, uh, woke liberal. This is liberal means generous. And I, I, I've come to two or three powerful conclusions in my life. And one of them, dealing with farmers every day, is that there's a squinchy, cheap ass mentality in farmers that oh, I, mean, I, ain't, I, I don't need no stinking minerals. I, you know, they don't need, they can go find it. They can go drink that, eat, eat that snow. You know, there's a kind of a squinchy mentality of not putting good things in front of them. And this, this, this is like, say, this is ancient wisdom. Uh, a liberal in providing utensils is the saving of both time and labor. The more perfect the instruments, the more profitable they are. Uh, so it is with working cattle and his stock. Uh, the most perfect in their kind are the most profitable. So, you know, this is, this is when they had gentlemen farmers. And this was true in the East Coast. A lot of the early immigrants were gentlemen farmers. They were literate. They read a lot. And they, they knew a lot. And this is the mentality that came out of that. So, again, it's just one of those things that just struck me about how ungenerous, how unliberal people can be uh, with livestock, and then the wheels fall off, and then they call the vet, and then they got pink eye, and they got foot rot, and they got calf scours, and they got calf pneumonia, they got anaplas, they got all this stuff. They're more than willing to pay you big bucks to treat that, but you know, nothing on the front end, or not much. And the thing I liked about what, what we heard earlier uh, today from Cooper is how, um, how they, oh, we don't make our cattle eat snow. 
we want them to have good water. You know, that type of stuff really uh, cheered me up. Uh, again, I could talk all day, I won't, about the benefits of apple cider vinegar. In my whole 40-some years as a vet, I've never seen anything that pays you to give it. And this works for every single person. Uh, we, and I have some literature over there on the right kind of apple cider vinegar, how to use it. This Dr. Jarvis was a folk doctor in the uh, East Coast in New York when, when 100 years ago. And he advocated pretty much whatever's wrong with you, take apple cider vinegar, mix it with raw honey, and drink it down. And my folks believe that. In fact, I have my mother's uh, book, uh, Folk Medicine, uh, that we used. And my, my folks drank apple cider vinegar every day. Uh, this is just a simple uh, mineral hopper uh, that we use. This is a mineral concoction that I put together 25 years ago. Uh, there are so many bad mineral um, products that are out there. And I know this because about 15 years ago, a guy called me up and he said, uh, hey, what do you think about, uh, I think it's Billy Bob's Mineral or something. I said, I don't know, there's thousands of them. So cut out the label, this is for cell phone cameras. Cut out the label and send it to me. So I'm looking at it and it's like, this is garbage. This is a bag of DDGs and a bag of salt with a little spiff of mineral stone in it so they can sell it as for $25. And I, I called the guy up and I said, what do you like about this stuff? And he said, oh, it's $25 a bag. And I didn't say it, but I was thinking, you got screwed big time, dude. Uh, this is a $2 bag. I can make this all day long for two bucks because there's nothing in it. And of course, he had heard health problems. And I got to thinking, I, I had to see what else is out there. So I just opened it to the public. I, I'll, and to any of you, I'll give you a free review of any mineral label that you send me. Just tell me what you paid for it, how long you've been using it, uh, how your cattle look, and if they like it, how much they eat. And I've done 1,200, 1,300 of these now. A lot of them are repeats, like Purina, Wind and Rain, Junk. Uh, uh, and and they're, I grade them like a school teacher, A, B, C, D, F. And they are all Ds and Fs. Uh, I saw a couple of Cs. This is what A plus looks like. Uh, you got to have phosphorus. You need a one-to-one -one ratio of calcium and phosphorus. Heart, the only salt that's in this is from the kelp. There's 300 pounds of Thorvin high iodine kelp per ton. Uh, you've got to have uh, copper is, like I say, that's your, your warmer. You've got to have selenium, that's your vaccine. Uh, and look at those numbers. Uh, you look at the zinc in that, uh, that, uh, that we've got 8,000 parts per million. Uh, and then fat soluble vitamins, A, D, and E, uh, just loaded with it. And I thought when I first formulated this, I thought, oh my God, this is going to cost three or four hundred dollars a bag. So I sourced it all out based on nothing from China, uh, and it it was like forty dollars a bag. I could make it for forty bucks a bag, the A plus recipe. And I I started selling it. I don't sell it anymore. I sold that company to Thousand Hills Cattle Company, and they I think it's forty eight dollars a bag now. But this is the this is a gold mine, and they only need an ounce or two of this. It, this is from Grass Farmer Supply. Um, uh, so it's not a commercial. And this is not everything that's in it. I can't lie and say something's in it if it's not, but I don't have to list anything. Because what would happen, people would get this label and then they would go to their local mill and they go, hey, can you make this for me? Sure, I can make that. Well, you know, then behind the scenes, they're like, well, he doesn't know. This, uh, we're just going to use this one and we'll switch this. And he doesn't need that much stuff in it. So they make a, a faux version of this. And they call me and go, you know, your mineral is just, I still got pink eyes, still got flies. Oh, really? I, where did you get it? Oh, well, I, I had it made for me. Well, so I left about 15 ingredients off of this that, that aren't in the, the knockoffs. I, I did it just because I don't want people to uh, be confused. This is your first taste, maybe, of a product called Lassahol. And I showed that picture earlier, Clifford Willis, when he was at University of Missouri, he invented Lassahol, which is fermented molasses. And this is rocket fuel. You mix this with your vinegar. Lassahol is a hydrogen donor. And as some of you know, you can burn carbon. You can burn a tree or, or charcoal or coal. And that's burning carbon. It's a very slow fire. You're never getting an airplane up in the air on carbon. They use an oxygen fuel. Uh, if you're going to fly a rocket to the moon, you burn hydrogen. And that's what this is. This works on the Krebs cycle. And this, this is rocket fuel. And the, 
I don't recommend it to everybody, but the number one limiting factor in livestock production is energy. Energy, energy, energy. And so most people are feeding low bricks food, low energy food, and they, they can't put fat on them. So we give them apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar in a nutshell stimulates the cellulosic bacteria in the rumen to break down cellulose. What's another word for cellulose? Wood, yeah. Cellulose is wood. We can't digest wood, uh, but a termite can because they have cellulosic bacteria. Any ruminant has cellulosic bacteria, so it stimulates that. When you look at the manure of an animal that's uh, eating apple cider vinegar, it's like, we call it pumpkin pie consistency. I hope that doesn't ruin anybody's appetite. But it doesn't look like horse turds. It doesn't have sticks in it. I'm, I'm a manureologist, by the way. I got a degree in China uh, in uh, bullshit tin. This is, a, this is an advanced course because I'm going to give you this recipe. Back, you remember back in the recession, 2008, 2007, there was the lowest number of, of cow herd in America in our lifetime. Uh, people couldn't afford to keep them, so they sold off the, the breeding stock, and the numbers got down. Where it, uh, it impacted me, I work with a lot of Amish, mostly Amish guys that raise dairy bull calves. And in the dairy industry, calves are the unnecessary evil to get milk. So they breed the calf, they, they throw the calf away, basically. They stack them up, uh, and they're like five or ten bucks, these Amish guys. So uh, they're five to ten bucks. They have a high mortality rate, but, you know, they, they, could, they could still make a living. Well, when, these, when the, the prices went up, they were $200, $300, $400 a pop. I thought my phone was going to explode. People call me, what do we do? What do we do? I, I said, well, um, I'm, I'm going to give you this list of this stuff. And it's kind of funny because Amish people are usually ridden their bicycle to a, salt, to a uh, public phone. and They're standing out in the cold. And they don't have a pencil with them. So, they, you know, it's like, what would you say? That, I can say that in Texas, too, by the way. I work a lot in Texas. When you tell a Texas something and they don't know what you said, they go, What? What? So anyway, uh, PDQ Rescue is a product that's 50% water-soluble kelp and 50% water-soluble humates. In other words, activated charcoal and vitamin C. And uh, because the first thing they have is scours. When you get these calves that had no colostrum, they're yanked away from their mom. When they're an hour old, they're thrown on a trailer with a bunch of other calves from other big dairies. Uh, it's a problem, so we stabilize the gut. Uh, we use the Lassahol Energizer I was telling you about. We give them a rumen starter of a lactic acid culture. We give them, the Nutraid is kind of like Gatorade. It's electrolytes, and we give them vitamin C powder. So I had Grass Farmer Supply just make up these kits. A kit will do about 30 uh, calves, and you can refill any component that you want. But we can keep basically anything alive. If it's still breathing when we see them, if we use this kit, we can keep them alive. And I work with North Star Bison now, and they're out of um, Rice Lake, Wisconsin. They, they're the largest grass-fed bison herd in the world. And they bang out a thousand head of finished bison a year. They're birth to slaughter. Uh, but they got a contract with Epic Meat Bar, and they need 3,000 a year. So we're over, now we're in the Dakotas buying baby bison that are short weaned. They're, they calve in May. They, they round them up in September, wean them off. The moms are like, what? Uh, and these baby bison normally would stay with their mom. You know, bison don't have a calf every year in the wild. Uh, so they're, these are highly short weaned. Uh, they throw them on a truck. We pay a fortune for them. By the time they get to Rice Lake, they're already scouring when they come off the truck. The next day, they're coughing and blowing a fever. So what we do now, we do this kit. And first thing we do, we hit them with a shot of Multi-Min 90 when they come off the truck on one shoulder. We give them a shot of um, vitamin A and D because they're extremely mineral deprived and vitamin deprived. And then we, the first drink of water they get has the PDQ Rescue in it. PDQ stands for pretty darn quick. This is the, the bugs, this is the Gatorade, and th these are my weapons that I use now because I don't use antibiotics. And this would be for pink eye, foot rot, anaplas, anything like this. You can buy these anywhere. 
Uh, the Multiman 90 is usually a light prescription on it because it has enough copper that they don't recommend it for sheep. So you can just buy it right from the vet. Um, and A&D you can get it, Fleet Farm or Tractor Supply runnings. Uh, and again, the, I'm flipping to how to get your bricks up now. And biochar, this is biochar that a friend of mine makes down in Winona. Uh, from, uh, he has a, whatever they call it. This is how much we put on a biochar. This is an old beat up corn and bean field that just is uh, nothing. Uh, and that, the, we planted a little alfalfa, it was about a three bricks alfalfa. We sprayed the, or we sprinkled the, the with a manure spreader, the, the, the activated charcoal on it. This is the same pasture when it came green again. And it, the cattle can't keep up with it. As you can see, it's seeded out there. Uh, and we have horses on it, and uh, if you want to ruin a pasture, I guess that didn't show up, uh, the horses can't even kill it. This is biochar, the difference between what they call terra preta down in the Amazon, uh, which they use charcoal, pottery shards, and manure, or compost. And this was a control experiment we did at home uh, of, of putting uh, the terra preta combo on there. And then I don't go into biodynamics too much because nobody's ever heard of it. Rudolf Steiner invented it in, in Austria in, in um, the 30s. And uh, biodynamics so is a fabulous form of, it uses a lot of vortex, like the manure spreaders. Uh, we make these vortices. Uh, you can, then you take your, your prep material. This is where we lose people. You put it in a cow horn with some crystal powder and you point it to the moon and it pulls energy down from the moon and stars. Uh, and then it's this potentized prep. Uh, acre, oh, this is another form of it. This is a, a Vortex um, uh, compost tea brewer. Compost tea is absolutely amazing. But anyway, we get these mycorrhizal uh, fungi uh, and we can spread that out and it's amazing what we can do. Uh, this is a water structure, two water structure units. Structured water is really a hot item in the drought. We can lower the amount of water a plant needs by about 30% or livestock by 30% just by putting one of these in the water line. It structures the water and the water, um, the little H2Os are kind of like a 110 degree angle, uh, oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen, uh, and they stack up kind of like Dixie cups when it's structured, so it's wetter, uh, it's, it's more harmonious with us. Uh, this will do it too. Um, this is a cosmic pipe. Acres used to be filled with these weirdos like Phil Callahan. Uh, there were several uh, people that were at these Acres USA gatherings. They, they're all kind of died up, but they have these cosmic pipes that are filled with crystal dust. We put the prep in a little opening there and we broadcast it to the whole field. Uh, so we're building this polyculture prairie. Uh, this is West Jackson. I learned some stuff last night at our conversation about uh, Kernza. West Jackson is a plant biologist and quite a rock on tour. He's been working with plant genetics for 40 years and he's invented a perennial wheat, uh, a quinoa. He's got uh, foods that really can feed the nine billion people we have. These are the roots on on wheat, this is the perennial wheat, the root structure. And uh, Wes Jackson is, uh, he won a MacArthur Genius Grant. He was considered one of the 10 geniuses in America. And I remember watching him on the Dick Cavett Show. They were interviewing the 10 smartest people in America. And they said, what do you think the number one thing is that humans have invented? And it was stuff like, oh, we went to the moon and penicillin and, you know, they. So they got to Wes Jackson and they said, well, Dr. Jackson, what do you think it is? And he said, oh, it's very easy. It's the aluminum corn scoop. <laughs> he, was, he was funning with him, you know. And they said, why? why? And he said, well, it's lighter. So this kind of guy he is. Uh, of course, Joel Saladin, most famous farmer in America. This is Mark Shepard. He's uh, the guy that kind of promoted silva pasturing. Uh, not a lot of this in, in the Dakotas, just because there's not a lot of silva. Uh, but uh, we, we, we try to do this all over. Uh, these are my goats uh, uh, at work, a typical day at work. And um, 
I have sheep and goats. Uh, oh, and this was the other thing I did uh, in that North Dakota place. The way, I'm sorry, the uh, North Carolina place that had all the trees, we turn forest hogs loose. And when the Pride Sasser, the guy that owns Rock House Farm, Stone House Farm, so, uh, he said, how are you going to reform this, this, uh, the, these trees? And I said, you could, it was, the tree brush was so thick you couldn't even walk a foot into it. I said, we're going to use pigs. And I, I kind of forgot that North, Dakota, or North uh, Carolina is the number one hog state. And he said, what bring pigs to North Carolina? And I said, oh, no, no, not those kind of pigs. These are forest hogs. And they cleaned that up, and it was just stunning what we could do. But I just, uh, you know, I was looking at some of the people, Steve Campbell, Kit Farrow, um, um, Todd Churchill, and I uh, um, can't remember the guy from Alabama's name. So I was just like uh, closing with this. Uh, here's the good old days, uh, which uh, are now. These are the new good old days. Uh, I like Kit Farrow. He called us, uh, these are solar bulls. They're not diesel bulls. Those are the two different categories of bulls that he, he talks about. Uh, that was just my disclaimer. Uh, being a vet, I, uh, you know, it's like you, don't, you wouldn't have to do it. Uh, Cooper didn't have to do it. But as a vet, I have to say, you know, this is just my opinion. It's my advice based on experience. Uh, if you know, consult your your real vet if you have a problem. This is about indifference. It takes 43 muscles to frown, 17 to smile, and doesn't take anything. Just sit there with a dumb look on your face. <laughs> this is about my job at Amer AGA American Grass Fed and the EOV. Uh, this is Grass Farmer Supply. Uh, that uh, is with them, I mentioned, uh, Defending Beef. Uh, and then uh, at Thousand Hills, we're really proud of what we make. Um, Cooper, was that steak, is Cooper, was that steak you showed grass finished or was that uh, grained? Grass? That's, that's the kind of lovely omega-3 fat that we want to see. Yeah, but your steak was, uh, was as good as that one. What is this? Anybody know what that is? Yeah, it's Kobe beef. That's junk food, by the way. That's the ultimate feedlotted animal. Boy, have they done a great marketing job. When I talk to people about Kobe beef, they're like, oh, yeah, they pet the cows all day, and they give them massages. It's a feedlot, you know. It's like, uh, but anyway, that, I, that is sickening uh, to taste. It's just like putting a big blob of lard in your mouth. Okay, so four things. We'll go fast through this. Uh, four things that you have to know. Uh, one is uh, start with good genetics. It's like starting on second base. It's going to be a lot easier. Uh, there again, what kind of animal, what breed is the one on the right? It's about this tall. Uh, they used to be called low lines. They're called, they changed the name of the breed uh, about a year ago. They're, they're called Aberdeen Angus now. And they're wonderful animals. We can't use them in our program because we have to have standardization. Uh, butchers want all the steaks cut at 8 ounces or 12 ounces, and they just don't fit in our program. But if I was raising my own cattle, I would probably get uh, the low lines. You can feed three of these little buggers for what that, that uh, feedlot animal would eat on the other side. And that's what we don't want. We don't want all this daylight under them. We don't want these long, heavy bone legs. We don't want all this head, thick hide. On these things, if you took their hide and pulled it out about a foot and it just snaps back, it's just they have hardly any hide. I mean, it's very thin hided. Uh, so the cutout on this guy is probably going to be 70% that you get paid for. Uh, this guy would probably hit 48, 49% cutout uh, because a lot of hide and bone. Now, this picture I could look at all day. And there's a funny deal about being a, a healer is that, and we all do this, we just forget, but if somebody has a flaw on their body, like if they're a hunchback or they have a limp or something, your eyes will go right to that, that pathology. Uh, there's a scene in, in uh, Austin Powers where he's talking to this person that has a big mole on their chin. And he's, he's sitting there, he's kind of ADD, but he's standing there talking to him, he goes, mole! <laughs> At a party. But anyway... Uh, the, the, this cow, your eye does not w know where to go. There's no pathology on this cow. She's, uh, she's deep, ch uh, deep chested, uh, good line here, nice square uh, udder. 
Uh, the rump drops off from the hooks of the pins. She's got a serene look. She's probably very maternal. And these fine, dense bones indicates tender meat. Fine, dense bones. This is, this is what we're, we're trying to find. And moderate frame. Uh, we like to buy bulls from someone who raises the cattle the way you ought to. Uh, you know, uh, they say if you're selling bullshit, you need a shovel. That's me. Whereas if you're selling the truth, you only need a teaspoon. I don't know why that fits with the Texas Longhorn. I happen to like Texas Longhorns. They are, they're very good eating. Uh, these are Waigus. This is where, in Japan, where Kobe comes from. And this is the guy in North Carolina. And he has a herd of Japanese Waigu, which you can't get now. They can't export them because they're considered a national treasure. But he has a whole herd of these. And if you were just driving down the road, you think, those are the worst looking Angus I've ever seen in my life. But he sells those, I think he gets $30 a pound on the rail <laughs> for the Waigu. Uh, and uh, they, they're very maternal, but he's, this is grass finished. Wagyu, which is an oxymoron. Uh, this is a, a pin scour. They're one of the few uh, continental breeds that we use. Uh, we, last night, Daryl, we were talking to that guy that had, uh, uh, what kind of cattle he had? He had semitols. And when I was a baby vet, my first year, the semitols and the Kiandians and the Charlais were coming in the exotics. They call them exotics, and they're breeding these dumpy little Angus heifers. Uh, to these exotics, and they were getting 120, 130 pound calves out of a little tiny heifer. I was pulling calves day and night. I was doing C-sections. I was articulating them in dead calf and pulling it out piece by piece. Uh, so that was when the exotics came. And I didn't tell that guy last night, but I, we always said the the uh, Kiandians would jump over your corral, and the Semitols would get under it and lift it up, and then the Charlais would just bust, bust right through it, you know. It was it was hell being a vet with these big exotic bulls coming in. But Pinscowers are really a nice breed. Um, this is uh, anybody know what this is? Highland Scottish Highland. This is Chad Peterson in the Sand Hills of Nebraska, and Chad has uh, Chad set a record. Uh, he's another one of our heroes. Chad was the first guy that we know of that broke the barrier of grazing a million pounds of cattle per acre. A million pounds in the Sand Hills, Nebraska. So how often do you think he moved his cattle? Once a week? Yeah, but yeah, you said a half hour? Yeah, it was about that. It was like the, at the most two hours. So his whole 37,000 acre ranch was grazed two hours a year. Just one pass. And they, they were grazed tight. And they developed, uh, as cattle do, uh, to, they're adapted to his land. That doesn't look like a typical one. That's also one of his Scottish Highlanders. But they, they work really good. That's what the calves look like, look like baby bison. Uh, British white, we love those. There are not very many. They're very expensive. Uh, they're really good. This is the, the guy I mentioned in upstate New York that has Murray Grays. And these, this guy's... Uh, it's really an interesting story. I run into so many interesting people in the grassfed business. I, I just like, I don't run into any jerks. I mean, it's, it's the nicest group. But this guy and his wife were prison guards for 25 or more years. Prison guards in a New York State prison. And they dreamed about grass-fed beef. They read about grass-fed beef. They studied it. They, they read everything. When they got out, they, they bought these uh, Murray Grays from Australia, the, the embryos and the semen. And this guy is banging out cattle at 16 to 18 months, ready to go to town. And they're high select choice uh, cattle, 100% grass. And they're, you can see how gentle they are. This is Steve Campbell. He's doing what's called linear measuring. He can take about 12 measurements of any animal with these calipers. And he can tell you exactly what your cutout is going to be, how much high dollar meat, uh, how much middle meat, uh, what, what your percentage of cutout is going to be just by using these measurements. And he's a protege of Gerald Fry, who's the late Gerald Fry. Gerald was the first guy to bring uh, linear measurement to America. Uh, like I say, unfortunately, he, he passed away. He's from Rosebud, Arkansas. I had Gerald up, at, I think, when I took these pictures, and he drove up from Arkansas, and he told me he got arrested but for speeding, and the, the highway patrolman pulled Gerald over, and he said, you got any ID? And Gerald said, about what? 
<laughs> this is a story of epigenetics. Uh, they called me out for this, uh, this uh, bull calf, and this is a uh, uh, belted Galloway. And they said, can you cure this? And I said, do you have a 30-30? And he was isolated. He was over in the burdock. The other cattle wouldn't accept him. And they didn't take my advice. They kept him. And I went back. Uh, there he is being isolated. I went back uh, a few months later, and there he is. And I went back a few months later. This is that farm down there. Whoops. Uh, I'll go back to that one because... There he is as the herd sire. So he had good genetics, but he had terrible epigenetics. And when we fixed his environment, his, he was able to manifest his true genetics. Because you buy good genetics, and if you don't treat them right, you will, they will not manifest uh, to get your money's worth. No, it won't go. This is a 19-year-old cow, and she's pregnant, and she's got a calf by her side. And this is the kind of stuff I see that just brings tears to my eyes to see that. She's a little pinched in the heart girth, but the rest of her, look at that top line, she's just fine bone, she's docile, she knows what the drill is, uh, she's, she's a keeper. Uh, you can see some of this, uh, a nice bull. Uh, when Steve Campbell goes around the country, he, he calls, he's, he's building the red solo cup cow. Anybody have a red solo cup? You know what they look like. And, and this is what we're looking, the, the top end of the red solo cup on this bull is the front end and uh, tapers down. A cow should go towards the back end. And uh, Gerald always said in the Amish churches, when the men sit close together, what part of their bodies touch? Their shoulders, right? When the women sit in church, which part of their bodies touch? And that's actually as it should be. My, Gerald never did, he, he didn't say it outright, but he, he just didn't, he was just kind of disappointed in who I married. Because Rebecca's tall, she's 5'10", she's built like a ballerina, and you know, she's just straight, and I could see him looking at her, it's like, well, not much of a breeder there, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, you know, she can run fast. <laughs> I told these guys at lunch, I said, my wife is always critical of me. She said, I have two major flaws as a man. One, I never listen to her. And then, I don't know, some other shit. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, Hereford that came out of Mexico. This is a closed herd for 150 years. They brought the, some of them up to Texas. And uh, he was all bull. He was really, and there was a... Uh, a red Angus across the fence. You can see they've dug up the ground talking to each other. So that was number one. There's four things. Number one. Number two is the high bricks nutrition, which I've already uh, mentioned a little bit. But I wanted to show you a comparison, and I can give you the, the source of this chart of the difference between GMO corn and non-GMO. And uh, GMO stands for God move over is what I've heard. But the glyphosate is, is high. But here's the surprising thing. It's all loaded with formaldehyde. What's the other thing we use formaldehyde for? Embalming, right. And it's high in there. And it's probably why they don't like it. If your cattle ever run out, get out, they'll run past GMO fields if they f sense that there's some uh, open pollinated uh, natural corn somewhere nearby. So anyway, it's just the, the minerals in it are very low. Oops, I knew I was going to do that. I get, I get over anxious. Uh, this is John Ingalls. He was a senator in the 1880s in Kansas, and he wrote a beautiful poem. This is not the whole thing, but it's called Grass is the Forgiveness of Nature, Her Constant Benediction. Forest decay, uh, uh, let's say, harvest perishes, flowers vanish, but grass is immortal. And it was just like the best uh, ode to grass I've ever seen. And this is another incredible book sold at Acres, uh, Andre Vasson. A French guy wrote this 150 years ago. The link between human an and animal health and the mineral balance of the soil. Soil, grass, and cancer. Who would put those three words together? But he figured it out. 
going to go past it probably. And then I'm a chapter leader for the Weston A. Price Foundation. Weston A. Price was a, a holistic dentist in the 30s. He, he couldn't figure out why some kids have rotten teeth and some kids have... They're, they're, they don't have enough room in their jaw. Their teeth are all scrunched together or their wisdom teeth don't come out. And other kids have perfect teeth. So he traveled around the world, seven continents, and he asked people what they ate. And they took, had them hold their mouth open and took pictures of their teeth. And he'd go to Africa and their teeth would just look like piano keys, just perfect straight teeth. They don't even know what a toothbrush is. And what he associated with was diet. It was all about diet. And uh, there's, there's other people that have, come across this, but he, uh, he wrote a book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Is Ann, where is, oh, there you are. You, you know this book, right? Uh-huh. I think I saw you at West A. Price Conference, didn't I? I can't remember. But anyway, uh, we have annual conferences, and they're, they're hot. They're really great. This is the other guy that figured out about soil nutrition, Dr. William Albrecht. He was a professor at Missouri University, and back in the 30s, they didn't have all the soil tests, and he figured out where the good soil is in America and where it isn't. And the way he did it, this is genius, he looked at the draft records of World War I, and all the boys that were 4F, in other words, they had fallen arches in their feet and they had rotten teeth, came from two areas in the United States, primarily. Appalachia and the Ozarks. And those are thin, rocky, horrible soils with low CEC, uh, and, and terrible. And, and World War I, they did a draft physical about like you do for a horse because World War I was fought on horses. And they, uh, if the horses had bad feet or bad teeth, they wouldn't hold up under battle. If boys had fallen arches or bad teeth, they wouldn't hold up under battle. So that was how, you, how they examined you, just like a horse. And actually during World War I, the Kaiser had the Germans yank out a lot of their crops and put in Net, nettle hay, nettle, stinging nettle, because nettle is the only plant you will ever run into with 4% calcium in it. You're, if, if you had alfalfa that had 4% calcium, uh, I would faint. It just doesn't happen uh, like that nettle hay. I'm going to go a little faster. And this is where all the good soils are in the United States. And you look at where we are now. And we've got good soil up in this area, up in the Dakotas. And then you get out a little bit further where Cooper is, and it's dodgy. Um, when I showed those eroded pastures, this is what we're seeing with compaction. And that's a penetrometer. You can make one out of rebar. Uh, just put a welded T-bar on it and push it down, put a point on the other end. And you should be able to push that right down. There's most of the soil I go on, it would be about like this floor here, trying to push that rod down in there. And if it can't get in there, the roots can't get in there. And this is going to be one of your limiting factors in bricks production uh, right here. And this is alfalfa, fairly year, uh, five, six-year-old alfalfa. And you can see there the roots went down about an inch, and then they went sideways because they couldn't penetrate the plow pan. And that's going to be a diminished low bricks alfalfa. How do you get rid of compaction? Well, there's several mechanical ways, as you can see there. There's aerators, there's rippers, but there's a lot better way that we do it, and that is with microbiology. I mentioned bricks testing. Again, you're shooting for 12. Uh, I, I have cherry trees and grapevines as a hobby. And I, when they leaf out in Minnesota in May, I will bricks the leaves. I'll crush up some leaves. And if it's below 12, I'm going to have a terrible crop. I'm going to have wormy cherries and moldy grapes. So I know then i got two months to doctor those plants. I'll put some lime down. I'll foliar feed them. I'll do all that stuff to get the, the bricks level up. But I mentioned earlier Ralph Voss. He's one of the inventors of the South Pole breed of cattle. Uh, down in Missouri, and this is the guy that was hitting 20, 22 bricks. Uh, he made the cover of Acres Magazine by doing this, and the way Ralph did it uh, was with raw milk. He, he foliar fed with raw milk, about 20 gallons per acre, and the plants just exploded. This is another way to do it. I've got some brochures from this C90 company. I like it. I like it as a mineral salt for livestock, and we eat it on our table. 
that's the only salt we eat at home. We, we, that, if you have a salt shaker, see one at a restaurant, throw it away and carry some good mineral salt around with you because that white stuff has got aluminum in it. Remember that list, what makes bad cowboys? Aluminum makes you an Alzheimer character. All these people with Alzheimer's have huge deposits of aluminum in their brain. So a lot of foods have aluminum, uh, certainly aluminum foil, a lot of cookware. If you have any aluminum cookware, get rid of it. Um, and then, uh, then use a good mineral salt. Uh, Redmond's, I have a little grief with Redmond's because they sell it as mineral salt. And I'll have somebody call, nobody calls the vet, by the way, when they're happy, right? The only phone calls I get is like, oh, my God, I got pink, I got foot rot, I got flies. Uh, so, you know, one of my questions, I'll give them 20 questions, like, what's your mineral plan? And they light up and they go, Redmond's. They go, Redmond's what? Well, Redmond's mineral salt. And I said, no, that's your salt program. You don't have a mineral program. That's just salt, 3% mineral, if that. Uh, this is... This is not a mineral program either, but it is about 22% minerals. It's the only one. It's a modern salt dehydrated in the Baja in Mexico. I put some explanatory charts because I talk to beginners sometimes. This is a pie chart. Uh, this is pie that I've eaten, and this is pie that I haven't eaten yet. I don't know if you guys know about pie charts. Uh, the food soil web. This is Elaine Ingham's uh, map of the food soil web. And basically what's going on down there, and I think, you, I don't know if, Annie, you showed the same picture or not, but, uh, oops, we figured that one out. But it's kind of like a, a coral reef. You've got predators and prey. The bacteria are the prey. They're the little bunny rabbits. And the foxes and the coyotes are the, the protozoa and the larger animals. But this this coral reef is the same as in a rumen or same in, a, in our gut. Uh, and I said I'd talk about this, and I, uh, Ann, would you bring me that a green meter, that soil meter? Yeah, that one. Uh, animals, plants under stress from radiation. What, what are these things in the background here? Anybody know? Cell phone towers, that's 5G. That's what it looks like. There's different forms of it. Thank you, hon. This is uh, one of the meters I carry around. It's called Safe and Sound. I'm not selling anything, um, but it's, it's a Pro 2 meter. Now, I'm going to turn it on. It's going to make an awful noise in here. Um, but um, this will measure on any farm. And I move it around because uh, radio frequencies are directional. And I just hit a peak of 72,000. And this dot here is going from high to extreme. These things don't lie. So if you have those kind of numbers on your farm, you're getting zapped. Uh, and, and you're getting it in this room. Uh, and uh, I'm going to turn it off because it's such an obnoxious sound. But this would not be a good room for students to be in. And I say students because uh, children have a uh, 100 times more vulnerability to EMF than we do. And how many kids have you seen that are, do, 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 you know, with a cell phone right up to their head? Or how many have you seen people holding their, their phone up to their head? And I got a lesson from God. I got a good one. I was at a party f 15 years ago, and I was, uh, a, the friend of mine is a plastic surgeon. He said, Will, get over here. I said, what? We're at a party. And he said, you have a malignant melanoma on your head, and it has to come off now. And my knees almost buckled. I was like, I don't, I'm not a cancer guy. I mean, you know, we eat organic food. We eat a lot of good stuff. Oh, my God. Two days later, I'm laying on the table, and he whacks out a chunk of my head the size of a silver dollar. He came in the room where I was recovering, and he said, well, Will, I saved your life. And I said, why? He said, that was a malignant melanoma, and we got it in time. It's like, oh, my God. So, so I went on with my life, and uh, six years ago, I had a th growth on the side of my head. If you look close, you can see a big old scar here. And I went into the same surgeon, and he said, yeah, he said, that, that's growing fast. I don't like that. I think you should get rid of it. Laying on the table again, he whacks about a five-inch incision on the side of my head. Comes in, he said, well, Will, I saved your life again. That was a, a malignant squamous cell carcinoma. So I got, then it kind of hit me that I'm a consultant. This is me all day. I got a cell phone here. I write with my right hand. So I only use my, my, the left side of my head. This isn't a cell phone, but uh, this, is, this is what I look like five, six hours a day. And it finally hit me. 
women that carry a flip phone in their bra get a tumor in that boob. Guys that carry their phone in their pocket frequently get prostatic cancer. These are all documented stories. And uh, then I realized uh, you do not want to have that thing up to your head, no matter what you do. And this is in Montana, Cooper, but I'm on this pasture looking at uh, uh, the radio freeze. Now, these big cables, these high, high voltage cables, are 440 to 660,000 volt cables, and they emanate uh, electrical frequency, magnetic frequency, and radio frequency, and they're very dangerous uh, to be around. And here we see them on pastures. Uh, there's a great book if you want to document this called The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg. This is an amazing book. It goes into depth about this. And he says about 4% of all people are radio sensitive. And they're usually people that can't be in a room like this, all these lights. Uh, they're bothered by that. And they frequently have uh, chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. And that is a radio frequency sickness. Uh, and, you know, the symptoms are, you know, trouble focusing, headaches, brain tumors, Alzheimer's, DNA damage, sleep problems, infertility. This one about decreased sperm count. Have you guys seen the numbers on sperm count? Uh, it's down about uh, less than, like, about 40% of what it was before all this. And there's other factors on sperm count and mobility. But this affects our bulls, our, our you know, all male animals. Uh, don't ever sleep with a mobile phone under your pillow. Uh, but this 5G is thousands of times more powerful than 1G, 2G, 3G. And they're cramming it down the throat. Because, you know, you live in the city, you expect to get poisoned. You expect more pollution. But rural America now, you go out, you live out in the country, you think, I'm breathing clean air and I'm uh, clean water. You're not. And uh, that's why I find the most egregious about all this is that they're polluting rural America, putting 5G everywhere. And there really is no EMF-free zone. Uh, Elon Musk, ha there's 5,000 active satellites over the Earth right now. And uh, this is the, the deal about uh, children. Uh, the, the cell phone penetrates almost completely to the other side of a five-year-old kid. A 10-year-old kid, it goes almost all the way through. And adults, it still uh, penetrates your brain. And you'll feel your ear getting hot when you have a phone up there. You'll, f you'll feel... A little bit dizzy a lot of times, just anybody, even if you're not radio sensitive. And again, this this little kid's got a, a, a cell phone attached to him. Uh, that was a picture of what, how many satellites are up above beaming us TV stations, radio stations, cell phone signals, Doppler radar, which is really nasty. Uh, so there is no EMF-free zone. Now, I, there are mitigation devices. I'm wearing one right now. Uh, this would protect me from my own cell phone. I still don't push Mother Nature. I don't ever put that thing up to my head. Uh, but these, this is a tiny peewee, one square inch. Uh, the same people that make these, we have ones that will protect 10,000 acres. One, one unit about this big and this thick uh, is thousands of times more powerful. This one just protects your body. Uh, I have one in my house that's seven by seven. It's five layers thick. That'll protect three and a half acres. So they come in all different sizes. Uh, but um, like I say, I'm not an electrical engineer, never pretended to be, never thought I'd be talking about electrics things, but I'm forced to because it's affecting our cow herds, our plant production. Uh, these, these radio frequencies zap the, pro, the, the livestock and the soil, the micro, microbes. They, they affect the pollinators, they affect the birds. Birds are, that's why they have a canary in a coal mine. Um, you know, if the canary falls over dead, you get the hell out of there uh, because they're more sensitive to it. And the birds are being zapped. The bees can't find their hive. Um, and animals can't migrate, butterflies, things like that. So, uh, so anyway, it's a problem. They hide these uh, uh, cell phone towers and they look like a tree or a flagpole because um, they know. This is a view out of my room right up the street here. Uh, at, uh, at the, the Hilton, uh, looking out my window last night, I, here's a high tension power line, there's a cell phone tower, uh, there's, there's a lot of it, and the readings was like 7,000 looking out my window of the radio frequency. Not horrible, but uh, it's bad. This is the 
uh, the one I have around my neck. It made their their website is uh, geofieldsystems.com. Geofield Systems, and you can read about how they work. They also have one called the emffix.com. The EMF Fix, and uh, they 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 talk about how to protect your whole farm. And I have uh, I just came from New York uh, speaking to grass dairy farmers uh, from Maple Hill Creamery. There's about 250 farmers there, and we, we've, uh, there are six of the farmers already that bought the big ag conditioners, the big, big ones that do their whole farm. And a couple of them, like five Amish farms, can all be protected by the same one. So I, the stuff I had with me, I just a little show and tell over there. You can, you can read about these things over there. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about soil biology. Uh, if we want to find out how many earthworms there are, this is one way to do it. We hook a battery up with two little copper rods, and the earthworms come wriggling to the surface. Or the best way is if you have a family reunion like Cooper was showing, uh, put a tarp down, have your little kids dig a foot by a foot by a foot, a cubic foot of soil, and count the earthworms. And the goal is to have at least 25 earthworms in a foot of topsoil cubic foot. And if you have 25 earthworms, that means you have over a million earthworms per acre. And if you have a million earthworms per acre, the entire topsoil of your farm will go through the belly of an earthworm every seven years, your entire farm. Uh, and that's how powerful they are. The other way we measure the soil respiration, we drive a pipe, a four inch pipe, like uh, for an oil well. Uh, into the soil, hammered in with a two by four and a sledgehammer. We put a cap on it and we wait an hour. Then we pull out some of the air that's in there and we measure the CO2 because the soil microbes exhale CO2 like we do uh, and they breathe oxygen. So we measure how much CO2 and that tells us what the biology of your soil is. That's just one way we do it. Which is kind of interesting when you think about nature because we are getting above 400 parts per million up in the sky of CO2 and that's climate change, that's global warming. Uh, the, if you take this probe right down on the bottom of the soil, it's about 4,000 uh, parts per million CO2 because of the respiration. And we're the mouths of a, a plant, they're on the bottom of the leaf, this tomato is on the bottom of the leaf, and plants, plants breathe CO2 uh, and exhale oxygen. It's the opposite of us, so this is perfect harmony. Anybody that's an atheist just has never been out in nature because it's so, so incredibly complex and amazing that it's like it couldn't just be by accident, all this beauty of how everything fits together. Uh, but so that's, that's part of it. And by the way, there are two things that disrupt the ability of you to assimilate oxygen. Two things. You can't, you, you, you could be breathing pure oxygen, you can't get it. One is this COVID syndrome, and the other is, uh, uh, that is the COVID sy syndrome. And there's two other things that cause you not to be able to get oxygen. One is glyphosate. And Don Huber, the professor from Purdue, will tell you exactly why you want to get as far away from glyphosate as you possibly can. It's, it's one of the biggest disasters on our planet. And the other thing that does it is EMF, radio frequency. It makes you unable to get oxygen. So when we say we're, we have the new biology where we don't believe in the germ theory anymore, there's COVID in a nutshell. You know, if you look at the parts per million people have of glyphosate in their blood, it's high for everybody, and everybody's being exposed to radiation. So you've got two syndromes that cause you not to be able to breathe oxygen. That's, that's what we think COVID is. is. It's an environmental disease. It's not... You can't catch it, you can't give it to anybody, it's never contagious, there's never been a virus isolated. So, never been any virus isolated. We're talking about bricks here, step number two. And uh, the D DRAM is a company that sells fish emulsion, one of many, this isn't a commercial for any of this stuff, it's just stuff that, uh, that is good. But they sprayed a foliar of DRAM, and they, the average bricks increased from five to 10. So if, if your bricks on your farm goes from five to 10, that's just like someone giving you a complete another whole farm. You've doubled the nutrient density of your soil. But not only that, the uh, 12 times greater soil fungal activity, uh, they got a 12 to one ROI return on investment. 
increased pasture yields 65 percent, methionine, lysine 2, uh, very critical amino acids, 300 percent more plant vitamin A, which is beta carotene. The bricks went from 5 to 10, just with one application of fish for, you know, 10, 15 bucks an acre. This is manure, a good manure field. This is my Vortex brewer for making compost tea. Uh, I don't actually use my brewer much anymore. This is apple uh, foliar feeding with raw milk on a small scale. This is the terra preta I mentioned uh, with the charcoal. This is just a little, sorry about a repeat here, uh, of where we put the activated charcoal out. I showed you this, uh, the cattle. Um, and. Come on, baby. And this is the horse picture I was looking at. I thought it was in there somewhere. Uh, they raise these gypsy draft horses. And uh, like I say, with, with horses, we figure they, we can't figure out why they destroy grass. We know they eat a third, they stomp out a third, and then we don't know what they do with the other third. But uh, this is another way we do it. This is a picture I'll show you a close up. We've unrolled bales out here. This, believe it or not, was a cornfield when I first saw it in uh, Mondovi, Wisconsin. And uh, they, were, they were plowing this and raising corn on that hill, which is in a little form of insanity. Obviously, it's not corn anymore. There you can see a close-up of unrolling bales. And the grass was just crazy. This is Will Harris down at uh, White Oak Pastures. I highly recommend you look up this video called 100,000 Beating Hearts. And Will Harris is a sixth, fifth generation uh, beef farmer in uh, Bluffton, Georgia. The TV reporter was from South Georgia that came out here today. And uh, she'd never heard of Bluffton, but uh, that's not too surprising. But this is what ground he's re rebuilding. This is old cotton and peanut ground. And if you think bean and corn ground is trashed out, you should see peanuts and cotton, what, they, what that does to the soil. And peanuts are very, uh, they're not really a nut, you know that, it's just a root nodule. But they're very prone to getting fungal infections. So they, they fluff up the soil and get all the organic matter. We're trying to build organic matter. Uh, they're trying to get rid of it. And because it makes for moldy peanuts. And so he's trying to rehabilitate this soil. And uh, this the red Georgia dirt. And this is what he does it with. And he's uh, one of the original guys with Stacked Enterprises. He had uh, a 1,000 uh, mama cows when I met him. I went down there and did some consulting. And I'm a sheep and goat guy. I love small ruminants. So he bought a 1,000 ewes and a 1,000 nannies. And he ran them right behind his cattle and nobody noticed. There was no difference in his grazing ability. We had free uh, meat from those animals. And he has turkeys, chickens, geese. I don't know, something, what else is there? Uh, ducks. He has all of those proteins. He has a white protein meat plant and he has a red meat pro, uh, plant right on site. This is a really uh, interesting vacation if you ever want to go down there and see something. But he said, the only enterprise I don't make money on is my chickens. He has 100,000 chickens. And he said, they're my soil building program. With these uh, m mobile uh, uh, egg mobiles, it really works. I mentioned this about, if you see this, this is set stock grazing. Uh, oh, and by the way, this is the Flint Hills of, of Kansas now. Oh, go back. There it is. Uh, it's they've overgrazed it, and what what do you do if you if you set stock grazed, you know? And I don't know if you do it, Cooper. I didn't quite get that, but we try to prevent the second bite. We want them to bite everything good, and not just the candy grass. We want them to do what he's doing, the non-selective grazing, where they're in a hurry to get everything that they can get. So they well they don't do that out here. Out here they put the cattle out there in May. They come back and get them in September, October in Kansas. The set stock graze, so they bite the candy grass, they eat it all, it tillers and comes up fresh again. They bite it again. As many times as they can get the candy grass, they will, and they don't eat the weeds. So pretty soon you got a bunch of weeds. So what do they do out there? They burn. They send all the nitrogen and carbon up in the sky because uh, they have to, the way they graze, they have to burn. Uh, and then what has happened now when I drive down there it's covered with a weed that cattle won't eat, this graveyard spurge. And uh, so this, this is a healing weed from God, uh, this healing, this man-damaged man land. I put this in there because you can't quite get, without the story, you don't get what's going on here. But this, this beautiful pasture 
is on the same land that his neighbor has across the fence. This is one of those fence lane photographs. And that guy has a useless land over there that does nothing. This guy here is grazing, two, he, he can produce 2,000 pounds of beef per acre per year. 2,000 pounds of beef per acre per year. This is in upstate New York. And his neighbor is sitting on that junk uh, field over there. But again, it was exactly the same land. I love those fence line pictures. This is the guy in uh, North Carolina that we put the hogs into this. We can see this. You know, where there was a, 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 a hillbilly with a lumber kiln and a lumber mill every half a mile. Now there's a meth lab about every half a mile out there in that area. Uh, but anyway, we, we put those fences in. We ran the hogs in there. Uh, this stuff started coming up that we never planted. And um, this is what it looks like when the hogs are done with it. We can't go any further than that because it's highly erodible. It's... Uh, that's one of the most level places out there. These are the Waigu cattle on the, the meadows. You can see we're moving uh, the pastures up into this now. So we can do silva pasturing. They can get up there and, and calve, get out of the sun. And all of this was junk, we, um, saplings and crap. And this is all highly uh, grazable land that we never planted anything. We had these beautiful warm season and cool season grasses coming up. Uh, this is another one that was a, a woods that we converted. You don't have as much problem with junk trees here, but in Wisconsin where this picture was taken, I have uh, varying from 400 sheep and goats to 1,200, depending on uh, how often I have to thin them down. But this guy called me up because he had a, a tree forest here. These are pine trees for wood. This fence is a deer fence because there's a vegetable garden here. So I put my, my sheep and goats in there. It's about uh, 40, 50 acres. Oh, this will be good for a month. So I come back a week later, and this is what it looked like. There wasn't a bite to eat anymore after a week with my sheep and goats in there. So we really cleaned this up. The other thing about, I, I do uh, invasive weed eradication, which I highly recommend anybody do. I get free grazing everywhere. But if they have any trees in their yard like this, this is what they'll look like about, about two days later. I had one guy call me, he had a Christmas tree farm that was, uh, he, he purchased and it was over, gray, it was, weeds were taller than the Christmas trees. I said, yeah, that's what I do. So I threw my sheep and goats in there. He calls me up, his hair's on fire. Oh my God, you got to get them out of there. They're eating the thing that, Sheep and goats love the most is Christmas trees. They were just eating the Christmas trees. So I had to get a bunch of herding dogs in there to get them out of there. If you have sheep and goats, uh, I, I, I could write a book on all the funny things, what happens when you have goats. It's always, it's always greener. Uh, this I won't talk about because Cooper already covered it, about uh, the difference in conventional grazing and rotational grazing uh, with uh, adaptive multi-paddocks. Uh, this is what a million, I think you showed a picture like this, Cooper. Uh, that was, I, had to be close to a million, wasn't it? It was a lot, yeah. Uh, cattle moved themselves to fresh grass. Uh, we couldn't do this uh, hot wires. Now even the Amish people, they have these solar panel uh, hot wires. Uh, this is just the difference that he talked about. This is that fence line picture I was going to show you. And this is what the beautiful grass uh, these cattle love, uh, there's a bunch of apple trees out there, and they, uh, they love eating those apples, and uh, it's just really uh, one of the great forages. I got to get on those flies, though, that's for sure. That's pre-pink eye. Uh, this, this is the guy in New York, and these are red Angus, and, uh, you know, that's his bull. You know, there's not very many bulls you can just stand there and pet him on the head. He's like a puppy dog. Uh, we try to uh, keep as much milkweed as possible. There's a huge problem with the monarch butterfly uh, and those uh, monarch uh, larvae there, caterpillars. Uh, if you've done anything with Kathy Voth, she has uh, a product, I mean, a concept called Cows Eat Weeds. She was a protege of Fred Provenza, and she has books about how to train cattle to eat weeds. It's a, it's a beautiful a uh, beautiful program. She has a wonderful podcast, Kathy Voth. Um, biodiversity is the key. Uh, this is actually some of Gabe Brown's stuff. This is his uh, uh, no-till drill. This is what's in it. 
A typical Brown Ranch uh, cocktail might have 18 species in it. And he, he can, if you haven't, it's right around, it's what, 10 miles from here. If you haven't gone to the Brown Ranch, you really owe it to yourself to see a guy can bang out 250 bushel corn. Then he runs his cattle in there and they graze the covers. Then he runs his pigs in there and then he runs his chickens in there. And he's making so much money per acre, it's, it's unbelievable. And I'll tell you guys, I don't tell people that aren't from North Dakota this, but uh, his, him and his son, Paul, have a c community garden for people that live in Bismarck. And he, he puts all of the seeds in the no-till drill, tomatoes, watermelons, carrots, peas, and they run it back and forth through there. So it's this jungle of produce. And people from the city here in Bismarck go out there and pick their own. And then they run the cattle in that after it's all picked over. Then they run the hogs in there and they run the chickens. And their, their profit, clear profit per acre on that garden, I think it's six acres, was $7,500 an acre clear profit. So he, that's why I say you owe it to yourself to go out and see. This, there, here we are at Gabe Brown's place. This is a cornfield. It was kind of funny. We were out there as Paul. Uh, we were out there. You can see the covers. You can see the cattle grazing, um, chickens. And uh, here we're just talking about the, the different kinds of manure. We're doing a demonstration of water rainfall infiltration runoff. Um, but we dug a hole in a trench in his cornfield. It had not rained in two and a half months. And down about three feet down, you could make a patty cake out of the soil. It had so much water in it. And that's, again, on 10-inch rainfall. Uh, I mentioned some common weeds earlier. This is what I call health from the hedgerow. Uh, you know, you, you look at alfalfa, part of the holy trinity for dairy people, corn, beans, and alfalfa. It's an okay legume, but it's not... It's not super great with TDN, protein. We look at sulfur because the most important amino acids are sulfur amino acids. Uh, what's that plant? Anybody know? Yeah, I'm sure you have it here. That's what I said, 4.3 calcium, uh, high TDN, very high protein, very high in sulfur. Uh, this is just a few pasture plants. The dandelion is a taproot plant. It'll open up your soil. All these uh, brassicas do it too. Uh, put that in your cocktail. But uh, TD, total digestive nutrients, 81% high protein, good calcium, good sulfur. Um, we like to see all these things. This is Jerry Bernetti. We were out at Chico State with the first organic dairy in a land grant college in the United States. And this was their dairy cow, and they had all this flood irrigated grass. And Cindy Daly, the, the dean of the school, or the president, uh, they had, back here they had a bunch of uh, uh, dock, sour dock. And she said, that damn stuff, it's about a third of our pastures. We cannot get rid of it. The cattle won't eat it. And we said, well, we'll show you something interesting. So I, we told her to take all the cattle off of it and then get a sickle bar mower and mow it down. So here's the sour dock or curly dock. Here it is after it was in the hot California sun for overnight. So it looked like this. We ran the cattle back in there, and they went running over to that dock, which is considered inedible, and they couldn't, they couldn't eat enough of it. You can see a few leaves that didn't get cut. They left that alone, but they wanted this, this dry stuff. Uh, it was so tasty. And these dairy farmers that were with it, they're just laughing their asses off. They'd never seen anything so funny. Uh, and then over by all the fences, they had this weed. What is this weed? What kind of what kind of plant is that? That's milk thistle. It's a type of thistle. We have it here too. Milk thistle is the one that if you have know anybody that's an alcoholic or has hep hepatitis, milk thistle, you can rebuild your liver with dandelion root and milk thistle. It's really an incredible plant for the liver. Anyway, these cattle, right after they ate all the dock they could find, they went over to this thistle, which has been there for 50 years, and they started munching it down. They put their heads down in it, and they nipped off every bloom off of this inedible thistle and just devoured it. They just polished it. Uh, again, I just wanted to show one little thing that I do. This is a boom sprayer that we use for foliar feeding. Uh, in my own pasture, which was brome and alfalfa, it was a horse hay pasture that was rental, I took this 40-foot boom sprayer, and I did a soil uh, forage test. I found out it was low in boron, so I put some borax in it. 
I put bugs, bugs in a jug. Uh, I put uh, this uh, potassium, and this is fish emulsion in the blue tank, um, like that DRAM stuff. I think it was DRAM. Uh, and this is kind of out of order, but this is a, a good manure pat with a lot of holes in it from dung beetles. And you can see the kind of dung beetles that you have most commonly here, uh, they're about the size of a ladybug. Uh, I showed you the, the big rollers, the big tumblers, uh, tumble bugs, that's what we used to call them when I was a kid. And they can take a ball of manure almost the size of a ping pong ball and bury it underground. Um, so that's that health from the hedgerow. Some of the uh, burdock and plantain, uh, or we, we do use a lot of kelp. When I was in England, they were hauling kelp from the ocean. We have to buy it. And then this is the last thing, the natural health that I do. I love going to places like California or something, show them how we graze here in Minnesota. Uh, I said, this is, yeah, this is a typical day of grazing at home. And, I, you know, our cat, this is our cattle. Actually, my mother sent me that picture. You know, we have a lot of ice storms down in Kansas. Then I tell them these are my goats, how, we, how I graze them. But uh, this is a vitality chart by Dr. Holliday, Richard Holliday. He's a holistic veterinarian. He's older than I am even. Uh, but we, we were talking about how two identical calves, spot and star, look of line. The, below this line, this is where your profitability goes to hell. But you can't see it until they show clinical symptoms. So, you know, we're weaning them, we're shipping them, we're vaccinating them, castrating them. Uh, various things, so their their vitality goes down, down, down. And the thing I like about this chart, this is 100% health, and then here's dead. And then right up, just barely above dead is like, maybe we should try the holistic approach, you know, which is always at midnight or on the weekend. Uh, and, and just above that is maybe we should call it that. Down and can't get up, feverish, not eating well, uh, you know, a little off. But anyway, this is how we look at the vitality. You can't always see it. So when we talk about holistic health for herds, I see this so often. I see piles of junk, big rolls of barbed wire and uh, junk. And you notice the cattle have been walking around on that. Cattle can't resist walking on a junk pile. Uh, but there's your foot rot in a nutshell. There's again another typical pasture pile. I don't like to see cattle in water. Uh, even water like that with a leaky ball valve. Uh, this is your liver fluke territory. Um, again, if you got them protected with enough copper, you're not going to ever have liver flukes. But this is where they get them, the, the snails that live in these water deals. Uh, Cooper, it was you I told about this, right? This is a statue in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And maybe some of you haven't seen it, but it's a hero cowboy. And he's got a calf. He's got his slicker on. It's snowing. He's got a calf across his legs saving the calf. And I, I told Cooper last night, I said, this, is a, this guy's not a hero. He's an idiot. You know, he's calving in the snow. He hasn't figured that out. Cooper calves in June. And, you know, you're not going to see him out there with a slicker on all covered with snow. But anyway, it's just uh, one of those funny things. They're like, how could you not figure that out? Don't calve when it's snowing. Uh, this is a study that was done, and this is the take home on this. Penn State, which is a dairy state, did a study of rumen development of calves. And they killed calves at four weeks, uh, 12 weeks, 16 weeks. And they cut them open and they looked at their rumen development uh, on different kinds of milk replacer. Because the big deal in the dairy industry is what, what do you feed? They don't give the milk, milk that we drink to the calves. They come up with soybean juice. Usually there's dried milk. There's high somatic cell count milk. Uh, they were trying to figure out which one was the best. And it varied from, that's kind of a composite picture. Uh, but uh, a calf that's not on goat milk replacer the rumen wall looks like this. It's pale because there's no blood supply. It's very, uh, there's no papillae on it. This is a great rumen. And what they found out is the rumen development of a calf by 24 weeks is locked in for the life of that calf. So especially your replacement heifers, if you take care of your replacement heifers and uh, the, ca the calves and don't do a short weaning, wean them lo as long as you can. We wean at 300 days in Minnesota. Uh, and uh, Cooper does uh, 100, 150 days at least, uh, and that's when they need that because that's permanent. That's going to be this this calf is is going to turn out to be 
uh, a high maintenance animal that you're gonna they're gonna make you go broke because she can't digest fiber uh, as opposed to the good cow. Thank you all very much. You guys have been here forever. <laughs> Thank you.